Good afternoon. We are filming in Gainesville, Florida, another episode of Before the Glory. And um, we can go over all the magazine covers and all the newspaper stories of uh, the history uh, that this ball player uh, made and accomplished in the 1960s. But Rick Riker, not only out of Wisconsin, I, we, our audience is a lot of younger people. And you grew up in, in the late 50s and 60s. You're a person, I've never done an interview where Walt Disney wanted his picture taken with you. If, if you had the audience I had, you would want to go over this day too. But you're a kid like any other kid in the middle of nowhere in Wisconsin and end up on the beaches of California. Um, was that your rookie year was with the Angels? Uh, I want to start with that day because that picture is probably at your house if you were there. Um, but that's going to gather a, a lot of that, attention. That's my profile. <laughs> so at the one end of my career, it's Walt Disney. First day, opening day, Anaheim Stadium. And at the end of my career, of course, I'm throwing out the pitch for the Angels here a couple of years ago. So those are the two pictures I show um, on my Facebook page. Very, very smart. Um, did you did you just have your picture taken with him? Did you chat with him? Well, I got to know him very, very well. And uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie Saving Mr. Banks. Not yet, but I know Tom Hanks. Well, I mean, I'm watching this movie, which was very, very well done. Tom Hanks and Emma Thompson. Of course, there's the threat to the movie about the impact that their fathers the author of Mary Poppins, and the father of Walt Disney, had on their lives. And Walt, after having spent 20 years to talk to this lady about getting the rights to Mary Poppins to put in a movie, he discovered that her problem had to do with her father, and his drinking, and his aberrant behavior, and stuff like that. And that struck a chord with the author of Mary Poppins, and it really sort of induced her to change her mind about the filming of the movie. So, I'm sitting there, having had this experience with Walt Disney, I'm bawling my eyes out because I know exactly what's going through his head. And the picture of me uh, in front of Anaheim Stadium, of course, an hour later, I hit the first home run, that kind of stuff. But I know that in his mind, he knows he's not going to be living much longer because he died about five months later. Right. And there's no way that the ravages of cancer got in that quickly while they didn't have him more. Yet, here he was having this wonderful time. You know, enjoying the day. day. Enjoying the day, yeah. And you were the phenom. Well, I don't know about that. I was oh, you were the phenom. I was a phenom. When you're, when, you, when you're on the cover of that many magazines, uh, newspapers, I want to now go back to what I normally start with. But um, uh, explain, if, if we're looking on the map, if somebody's watching this and they go on their other screen and bring up Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Where in Wisconsin, um, as they start to look it up, uh, where is this town and where is it located and what's it by? The, the well, if I, if I raise my hand, you see Wisconsin, okay? This is up where Green Bay is and this is a peninsula. Stevens Point, this little town that I grew up in, right here, right smack dab in the middle, about two hours north of Madison, south of the Apostle Island, so on and so forth. So, little town of about 11,000 people, wonderful city, wonderful education we all with the Harvard and Stanford and all kinds of different places, which is really a great place to go. Uh, also, this this whole thing is based on uh, we have been able to associate with baseball and promote education. And uh, from the start of this, we've now got associated with this whole thing over 20 bachelor degrees. You are a basis of education. Before I go into how many brothers and sisters, I'd like you to talk a little bit about your dad. He had to go to college and he had to choose a way to pay for the bills around the house and his wife and his first son. Uh, go, his first name is and, and then His name is Frederick William Reckert Dr. Fritz is what they call him. In fact, my son is named after him. I'm going to put him down here. But that's what it's about, right? You know? Well, he was, a, he was an orthopedic surgeon. He started his own clinic. He was a Green Bay Packer physician during their spring football practice. He's the reason that Bob Sun can play football because he discovered it. Uh, a situation with his leg which required a little lift. Bart was actually drafted as a punter. And my dad said, forget the pony, put the lift in, and I was in the Hall of Fame. But uh, he was very, very influential in my life. I'm the oldest of nine kids, so it's not like he spent a lot of time with me, but his, his work ethic and his uh, being a role model, and my mom the same way, they just, everything was right. No swearing, uh, stick to your guns, no smoking, no drinking, all that kind of stuff. And of course, they always emphasize uh, academics. 
And of course, I didn't find out until I was at the University of Wisconsin. I was actually on an academic scholarship. Oh, really? I, I don't know that, that myself. I found that out later for crying out loud, yeah. But I, wow. I think 25, every member of my football team, my class, was in the top 25% of the high school graduating class. And two years later, we're playing for the national championship. There's something to be said about that. Absolutely. Student precedes athlete, you know. If you're younger and you're, you're looking at a direction, well, you need to think about academics as really sort of the road to, to your success. When, when it's seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, you know, your academics, your sports, some kids do things to put money in their pocket, like shovel snow, rake leaves, cut grass. Um, uh, by now, if you're, if you're in seventh, eighth, ninth grade, you've got some little brothers and sisters. So maybe that might be spending time watching them while mom's doing something. But what was your first means of earning a couple of bucks in your pocket? Well, my dad got me a job at the Sula. In fact, my social security number, which is 722 of the prefix, has to do with an railroad employee. So I was 16 years old, and I was working night shifts, 3 o'clock in the morning. Really? Yeah, in the yard at Stevens Point, Wisconsin. I'll never forget about 3 o'clock one time. And, you know, trains, when they're moving late at night, you can't hear them, especially if there's not an engine involved. And I turned around, and this freight car almost flattened me. Really? But that's the first job I had, and I also had a job with the WIA. Uh, it's also the first job where I really learned not how to swear, but what swearing was all about. Oh, yeah. you know? So that was a little bit shocking. They say swearing like a dock worker, uh, swearing like a railroad worker or as like, well. Like you've been a dugout in the major leagues? Uh, pretty scary. My childhood was blessed with the association of that, but I learned, I learned what to do in life and what not to do in life. Um, so you've got hard work, good family, education, academics, and athleticism going through high school. I know uh, from chatting with you um, that the end result of when success comes, some, sometimes there's jealousy, sometimes there's animosity. Um, when you have all these things going for you, I also know from talking to so many different players, right? Very, very closely associated with Mickey Mantle. You, what this is all going to end up being is that you were so well liked by everybody that you was you associated with, no matter what we get to with this contract. Right. But that's that's really what developed in high school. What kind of guy? Obviously, I can get to the point where the angels, which I've already heard. How was it in high school? You, you had to be, I mean, don't get me wrong, if I was your buddy, right? You've got everything that I go to bed at night dreaming about. And I want you to not be, how, how was it with you and your it friends? Was one of, I was well received, I was captain of the teams and all kind of stuff, but my social life was non-existent. Really? I was so consumed with sports and academics that I dated a girl when I was a junior, and of course I went to the proms and all kind of stuff, but I don't forget, I had to be home at 10 o'clock because I had to take the SAT the next day. So that sort of personifies exactly where I was from a social standpoint. Are you glad you got, you know, you missed some good things, but you also missed possibly fiddling with some bad things, which teenagers fall into. Now when you reflect back on that, is the focus on those things which ended up setting up the, the gateway to your life. Uh, when you look back on it, I mean, you're, you're, you're a teacher now. Right. You are a teacher. Up teaching, right? Off yeah. the couch, right? So when you do look back on it, the focus on academics and sports, which your social life, your dating life, costs you a little bit. But there's time for nothing else. Really. And yeah. don't kid yourself, I made up for it when I got <laughs> to know, the big leagues. I was <laughs> single till almost the, the time I retired. So I did have some fun. Senior, senior year in high school, for kids that have dreams and hopes, you're garnering attention as a teenager in high school to go to one of the most well-known schools for all of the things that it takes to get to this school. What were you doing to garner this attention? Explain some of your, your because it wasn't baseball. Uh, for, for the people that think it's baseball, what led him to college was his football ability. But what was going on? How, what kind of player were you were to be this guy in the state that's going to this university? I was sort of notorious because I'd broken out of our scoring record and there was a couple of games where I had 350 yards on 10 carries and five touchdowns and things like that. But I was also state track champion in the long jump. I was second in the 120 yard dash to a guy that had the state record for about 10, 15 years. And our basketball team was number one in the state in the sophomore, junior, and senior, even though we never got to the state tournament. So it was a combination of things, but I never really paid much attention the attention I was getting. I just was enjoying life, 
They're just too busy to even notice. What, what position on the football team were you playing offense and defense? What, what, uh, what were pretty much a safety to? on defense, and I was a halfback. You were, you were running that ball. Running that ball. Yeah. Four years of high school running that ball. Yep. Mm -hmm. Even as a freshman, I started. So, you were so now you leave home for the first time. I mean, you packed bags, yeah. right. the oldest child at nine. Right. Leaves home. But guess what? What? I was home every other weekend because I was really? such a mama's boy. <laughs> it was horrible. You know. How far? That's a great question. How far was Stevens Point? It's about two hours. Okay. But you I didn't have a car. I know. So I, I had to find a ride somewhere because <laughs> they weren't going to come down and pick me up for sure. So you, you get you get to school. You're a freshman. You've got your classes. Um, your dad studied to be a doctor. I don't believe, and I'm not discounting a bunch of athletes, I don't believe you were there to be a business major. I was Academic. in pre-med, yeah. and I had all the tough courses. I actually had to choose psychology. Psychology is my major because our football and baseball practices were in times when there would be science and chemistry and things like that, which would be the normal majors for uh, pre-med. So, football comes around, you're a freshman, I'll let you go. Explain what went on. A lot of freshmen, uh, uh, 40 years later, are redshirted. A lot of this, you know, but there's, but I'm not talking about now. What was it like? You walk on, you're a well known freshman, there's juniors and seniors there. What was the system like? Well, all, all these guys were pretty well known because, you know, keep in mind, these, this team played to the national championship two years later. But we practiced with everybody else. Freshmen could not compete on an intercollegiate level until they were sophomores. So, we were sort of like maybe the fifth or sixth team in terms of their priority, but we had a wonderful coach in Fred Jacobin. He's the guy that recruited all of us, 25%, top 20% of our class, and I learned a lot about football. And in those days, of course, as you know, we played both football and the um, So your body, right? Uh, obviously, you're invincible at this age, 18, 19 years old. You didn't play games, so your freshman year, you're, you're going into your sophomore year, if you follow me, no injuries, your body's fine. Well, I had an injury. You, the very last year? play of spring football practice. Ah, I thought it was sophomore year. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I sprained my ankle, and my dad, three months later, he moved a piece of bone about like my finger from that ankle. And that's sort of what precipitated my interest in playing baseball the following spring because I had a bunch of concussions, I broke two wrists. I had was this in high school? This is college. Oh, it was. It was in college. <coughs> never got hurt in high school. Never. <clears throat> so the injuries in football that has a young kid thinking about all this athleticism, track, baseball, football, the injuries in football your sophomore year right. really And had, in my junior year beyond that. So then I knew I didn't want to play professional because I could have done that too. As did many of my teammates. I mean, eight guys from my class of 1965 played in the NFL. Eight guys, I think the closest team to us was Notre Dame in the NFL three. So we had some wonderful, maybe not the greatest football players, but really, really good athletes. Guys, so we're going to make smart it. Smart guys. Yeah.